and speaking, please keep yourself muted so that we can all hear each other clearly. Isaac? Sorry, I am muted. Yes, if you do see any gate crashes or anything that's inappropriate, please do let us know. So obviously we can handle that to make sure that the event continues as smoothly as possible. Um, we'll also have our social media information in the group chat uh, below shortly. Um, and please, yes, do stay on mute just so that we can keep everything proceeding as usual um, and on schedule. And obviously to make sure that we don't interrupt the guests when they're speaking. Thank you. Come here. There's someone unmuted, but that's okay. Um, one thing I did want to do before we start is um, I can't recommend enough the book, The Repeating Island. I don't know if um, anybody else has read this book. I really love this book. That much should be very obvious. But there's a paragraph that I want to read from the introduction that um, I think about often when I look at. Um, Caribbean culture and carnival. It's not too long, so please bear with me. Should just take a moment. Oh, and by the way, the writer is Antonio Benitez Rojo. As to the rest of the Caribbean, uh, excuse me, as to the rest, the Caribbean text shows the specific features of the super syncretic culture from which it emerges. It is, without a doubt, a consummate performer with recourse to the most daring improvisations to keep it from being trapped within its own sexuality. In its most spontaneous form, it can be seen in terms of carnival, the great Caribbean celebration that spreads out through the most varied systems of sign, music, song, dance, myth, language, food, dress, body expression. There is something strongly feminine in this extraordinary fiesta. Its flux, its diffuse sensuality, its generative force, its capacity to nourish and conserve, juices, spring, pollen, rain, seed, shoot, ritual, sacrifice, these are the words that come to stay. Think of the dancing flourishes, the rhythm of the conga, the samba, the masks, the hood, the men dressed and painted as women, the bottles of rum, the sweets, the confetti, and the colored streamers, the hubbub, the carousal, the flutes, the drums, the cornet, and the trombone, the teasing, the jealousy, the whistles, and the faces, the razor that draws blood, death, life, reality in forward and reverse, torrents of people who flood the streets, the night lit up like an endless dream, the figure of a centipede that comes together and then breaks up, that winds and stretches beneath the ritual's rhythm, that flees the rhythm without escaping it, putting off its defeat, stealing off and hiding itself, embedding itself finally in the rhythm, always in the rhythm, the beat of the chaos of the islands. So it's just something that um, I thought maybe might be useful for listeners and for presenters, but also because it's just a really wonderful passage. So thank you. Now, thank you, Marcia. What a way to set the scene. Um, right, so to kick off the event, it is my great pleasure to introduce Alexander de Great. So Alexander was born in the port of Spain, Trinidad. He grew up in London from the age of five. On leaving school, he became a professional musician and songwriter. He spent a year in the USA playing and arranging with a 50-piece band. He has a BA in music from Dartington and a PGCE from London University. He has taught music at all levels, lecturing on Calypso at the universities of Huddersfield, Leeds, Nottingham, Queen's University, Belfast, Morley College and Goldsmith College, University of London. After three decades playing and writing in a variety of styles, Alex returned to his Calypso roots in the late 1980s. TV and radio appearances include in the UK, Europe, USA, Trinidad, Dominica and Canada. Since February 2000, he has been a Calypsonian in residence for the BBC, for whom he has composed more than 500 topical yeah. episodes. He was UK Calypso monarch in 2010 and 2011. Alex runs his own record label, upon which he has released 16 CD albums, EPs of his songs. He runs Calypso and poetry workshops in schools, colleges, and a variety of social learning platforms. From 2010 until 2020, he was a trustee member on the board of ACASA, Association of Calypso and Soca Artists, and the advisory board of the Notting Hill Carnival. He continues to be on the board of the UK Biennial International Steel Pan Conference. Wow, 
<laughs> Please, let's hear from you, Alex. Who is this person of whom you speak? <laughs> it sounds so funny when you read my bio, Gout. <laughs> uh, all those things, yeah. I I'm just an ordinary person, really. Um, history of Carnival. I'm a Calypsonian, so here's the history of Carnival, the way I would like to say it. <laughs> The origins of Caribbean carnival go back a long way. The slaves were not allowed to participate till Emancipation Day. Plantation owners would celebrate. The slaves watched from behind the gate, but they took it over from 1838. History of carnival. Carnival history must not be a mystery it should be there for us all to see history of carnival a fire on the plantation was the cambule the burning of sugar cane the slaves would have to do their best to save the crop which they did again and again after a ban by the authorities it gave the ruling powers some unease for there were riots in town in the 1880s history of carnival carnival history must not be a mystery it should be there for us all to see history of carnival captain baker decided to ban the drums in 1883, he said the only trouble caused at Carnival was down to street rivalry. But you cannot keep the people down. They used bamboo to replace the drum song. And from old oil cans, the steel band came around. History of Carnival. Carnival history must not be a mystery. It should be there for us all to see History of Carnival West African griots used to sing Kaiso Before they were all slaves Keeping the people informed of what went on From cradles to graves Calypsonians is what they became Singing songs of pride and songs of shame And when it came to politics They knew whom to blame History of Carnival Carnival history Must not be a mystery It should be there for us all to see History of Carnival the carnivalists took this thing to Toronto, New York, and Notting Hill. Participants are now many millions strong, and you know they're still growing still. In a world where things move so fast, we cannot lose touch with our past. And we must teach our children so this thing will last. History of carnival. Carnival history must not be a mystery it should be there for us all to see history of carnival so yeah you go that's a potted history of carnival if you like um it's specific to trinidad that song in that captain baker was chief of the police in the 1880s there but um to look at the history of carnival i've got some Questions which are just to guide me, which um, Afia provided me with. And why did Carnival begin in so many different parts of the Caribbean? Well, there are two answers to that. There are two factors to that. First of all, um, Carnivalesque, the idea of masking up for the way the rich played as though they, were, they played it down and the poor played up is a very, very ancient idea. It's at least 6,000 years old in the kingdom of Kemet in the upper Nile, we know they had days that were outside of normal time. Uh, there were 360 days in normal time and five days outside of normal time where people could change, the poor could pretend to be kings and the kings could pretend to be shepherds and what have you, things like that. So it's a very, very ancient idea. Secondly, there is the Catholic church 
where carnivals have been enacted, well, since Roman times and before the Roman Saturnalia, where again, masking up, partying and having a good time before perhaps a time of um, less extravagance, which is Lent in the Christian faith. And so two days before Lent, you can party like there's no tomorrow. And in fact, the masking up, dare I say it, was in order that people could play a little bit party with um, some illicit liaisons, let's call it that. Certainly the rich people used it for that purpose. So what you have in the Caribbean is you have enslavement, you have the enslaved watching what goes on during this festival uh, before Easter or before Lent and mimicking it. But the Africans had their own festivals of the same ilk. The idea of masking up, mm. the idea of the Mokojumbi, which is the stilts walking, you know, dancing on huge stilts. That is an old West African idea. In fact, I think it's probably wider than just West Africa. So to answer the question, anywhere where there was slavery and where they serve European masters, they would emulate what was going on. Now in 1838, I don't know what it was for other territories, but the British territories um, were, well, it was 1834, they ruled the end of slavery, but they tricked the slaves because they made them work another four years as indentured servants, if you like. So from 1838, the abolition of slavery allowed for the previous slaves to do their own party. And of course, they incorporated their African dances, their African ideas in with what the Europeans had. And it's an interesting fact that even up to the 1950s, the carnival in Trinidad, there was a carnival queen who was invariably either very, very pale skinned or white, who was crowned as queen of the carnival. And as the mighty Sparrow said in his song, Carnival Boycott, um, he sings a chorus which, in which he says that the queen does nothing for carnival, she only pretty and that is all. But men like me and you, saving money to play history and juju, all we get in is a case of beer and a talk up as band of the year. So he objected to that. And from, because the Calypso, the Calypso competition back in those days, the, the winner got, I think it was $25. And I'm not talking $25 US, $25 Trinidadian dollars, which wasn't very much money. The Carnival Queen got $5,000 and a new car. So um, in answer to that question, I think we don't know, I certainly don't know which island first saw Carnival. What I know about the British um, territories is that it started in 1838 and once they were allowed the freedom to express themselves, they did so. So um, that, that is kind of, um, you could say, where did it first start? I don't know. I don't know what the Spanish territories, um, when they got their emancipation, uh, but I'm sure Murey will be able to <laughs> inform us of that. And um, of course, along with Carnival came the, the drumming that was so much a part of the African tradition. The drums were banned at a certain point, certainly in Trinidad, and you can't keep people down, as I say in the song. What then happened was that people adapted bamboo. Bamboo grows widely and very fast, and you could use big bamboo sticks to bang them on the ground or hit them together in order to make drumming sounds. That's one thing. The second thing that happened, perhaps an accident of history, often accidents of history happen, is that with the arrival of American troops in Trinidad, there was a military base built. And military bases require oil for all sorts of reasons, machinery and so on. And where there is oil, there are oil drums. And when an oil drum is able to be hit with a piece of metal or a lump of wood, you see the start of the steel band. You see the beginning of steel pan simply because of that fact that there were oil drums around and drums had been banned. And when they were told they couldn't hit the oil drums, of course the people said, but these aren't drums, they're oil cans. Drums are wooden and covered in skin. So the ordinance banning drumming doesn't apply to these things. And so you get that sort of, that's kind of one of the, um, the things that comes out of that. I'm not gonna talk about costume. I'm not gonna talk about masquerade because Clary will no doubt have plenty to say on that topic. 
How am I doing for time, by the way? Tell me. Because I don't know, it's 10 minutes odd? You are doing fine, yes. Okay. You have another five or so minutes. So okay, like good, it. good. Fine, so um, um, let me just look here, what I've written down. Um, the dances. Well, yes, there were different. One of the things that happened also was something called the tent. Now, a tent is an all encompassing term. People or, 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 or the, the, the slave societies, first of all, let's go back to Africa. There were many, um, there was a society or African societies had almost what you might call them as regiments. They had kings and queens, princes, princesses, various rank in, in terms of importance. And this was part of the carnival strategy. And also the tent was so called because you would use a yard and you would make a tent out of banana leaves. They're very large leaves and they go, make a good shelter from the sun. So you just weave banana leaves together and you have a tent. In these tents, children would be taught things, they'd be taught dances, there would be um, the making of costumes and culture would be taught to the younger members of the community. And these turned eventually into what are known as, we now call them Calypso tents. And in a Calypso tent, the Calypso singers would write songs or compose songs about all sorts of matters in the world. I mean, it could be almost anything, but politics came into it strongly. In the Calypso tent, it was a sacrosanct place where you were allowed to write songs or compose songs ridiculing the masters. You were allowed to express yourself however you wanted. And of course, one of the things that comes out of that is that politicians become very scared of what the Calypsonians are going to say. And again, there were times in the early 1940s or the 30s and 40s, certainly in Trinidad, but also I'm sure in Barbados, and other countries, other, other islands where there was Calypso, and there were many, um, where the police would stand around to see whether you use any subversive lyrics and would try and clamp down on it. This, of course, didn't work because as soon as you start doing that, it gets worse for you. There are more uh, songs written about the authorities. And even to this day, it's a fact that the newspapers, certainly in carnival um, areas where carnival is is still practiced. The newspapers a couple of weeks before will talk about Calypsonians and the songs they're writing about the politicians. And believe you me, the politicians are scared. They're scared of their credibility being <laughs> taken apart by the rudeness of the songs if necessary. And so, and they use double entente and they use metaphor and all kinds of ways in which to portray these people. So it's, Carnival is a thriving, wonderful art form with, with a mix of all things to do with partying, masquerading, um, pretense, and again, taking the people in power to task for their transgressions against the people. How's that? Thank you so much. My pleasure. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for your time and for um, sharing your knowledge. For everyone can just bit of a clap. Thank <laughs> you for that song in the beginning as well. Thank you very much. Um, we will take some questions at the end. There will be a session of question and answers, but if anyone does have any burning questions right now, if you can put them in the chat and then we'll pick that up at the end. Um, but I will now like to hand over to Isaac to introduce our next speaker. Hello, thank you. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Clarissa Landy, who is an acclaimed Notting Hill uh, Carnival costume designer, uh, carnival artist, theatre designer, and three-dimensional design tutor. So Clary has a BA in theatre design. She's an artistic director for Mahogany Carnival Arts, is an artist, associate artistic director for the UK Centre for Carnival Arts and Luton Carnival. Clary is known for her award-winning carnival designs, which feature in many world-class events. In her early career, she worked for Temba Theatre Company, the Carib Theatre Company, and the Black Theatre Season, designing shows from the Black Experience. With her 
highly skilled mahogany team, she creates opportunities for young people to access the arts through carnival craft and nurturing the talents of young people. And that is central to uh, mahogany's ethos. Her work includes performances at UNESCO, the opening and closing ceremonies of the first Afro-Asian games in Hyderabad, the Cirque du Surreal, the Bollywood Film Award ceremonies, and the grand finale to the Millennium celebrations in Singapore, as well as the opening ceremony for the Millennium Dome in London. Clary was awarded the Cacique Award for outstanding costume design for her costumes for the musical Carnival Messiah, and as an honorable MB for her contribution to carnival arts. Clary has 30 years experience in creating costumes for Notting Hill Carnival. She was the artistic director for the carnival segment of the Queen's Golden Jubilee Parade and for the creative performance of the opening ceremony for the Special Olympics in Leicester in 2009. Her work featured in the opening ceremony of the London 2012 Olympics and she designed and produced costumes for two cultural Olympiad projects, Follow the Light and Games Time, performed in the East Midlands. Her commissions include producing puppets for the Dubai World Cup opening ceremony, designs for I Believe India, and the giant warrior for the Chinese State Circus's production of Mulan. Annually, Mahogany produces costumes for international carnivals and other cultural festivals. The Museum of Iowa has acquired two Mahogany pieces for their cultural collection, and the diversity page of the current British passport features a Mahogany character. Clary also plays a lead role in staging the Luton International Carnival, nurturing emerging artists and creating programs for developing the craft of carnival while contributing to the cohesion of the community. Wow. <laughs> uh, Clary, please do take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, we were given a set of questions, and I thought I would actually follow those because I assumed that each person talking today was given something because we were going to complement each other. So I need to share my screen. I just but you can't really talk about costume without seeing some of the some of the characters and the images. So I did prepare some images. Where do you how do you want me to do this, Isaac? If you uh, click share screen, we should be able to accept you. Uh, then it should work. I've done that. Okay. Um, I'm just waiting to see if. Because usually what happens is when someone wants to share a screen, it, it comes up and then I click uh, accept. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, okay. Because I usually have to make sure it's on. Do you mind if you could just please try again? Do you mind just trying again, if that's okay? I shall, I'm pressing screen share now. It says host disabled participant screen share. Right, I don't know what's happened there. Okay, what I'll do is it says, okay, someone has very kindly said you need to be co-host to share. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to make you a co-host as well. So hopefully that should work. Yeah, let's see. I don't know. Ha! Something has happened. That is very good. Okay, can oh, we yeah. see this, everyone? <laughs> can you see that? Yes, thank yes, you. Yes, we can. Y yes, we can. Okay. Okay, so I decided um, we have got a set of questions. And so the, my question was the first thing was the significance of, of costumes. And, I, and this is one of my favorites. He's called the, the Bookman the book mass. And basically what we're looking at is we're looking at the, the overseer, a caricature of the overseer ticking off the names of the slaves um, as in, in, in slavery days. Um, and in this caricature, it's really such a powerful presentation of, of the devil in those days. So remember that carnival is a pre-Lenten Roman Catholic festival. So to, put, to personify the devil in, in this way, take a close look at the face, the caricature, and the enactment of that ticking, bringing to life the devil and actually portraying 
through the life experience, lived experience of those who originally came up with this shows the powerful use of the vocabulary of carnival, that you can share your life experience through the mass that you have made and, and make it very clear how that caricature is, is presenting um, the personification and the ingenuity of thought through those who first created him. So when I look at it, I think, always think of who invented this first, who created the first character? What was his experience that brought, that made him bring this to life in this way? And still to today, we have these characters with us. And there are many other traditional characters, but they do very much come out of that slavery experience. And that thing, as Alex has already mentioned, in the way that the words worked, the visual in the mass also conveys very important um, political or and historic um, events and so, so, sociological issues come forward in it. So we have this personification of Lucifer and the devil in a pre-Lenten Roman Catholic festival, so key. How do we, can you see this next image? Has that come up? Yes, it has. Thank okay, you. just checking. Okay, so today I use that, polit that powerful vocabulary of telling stories with costume in this way. And I'm gonna take you to an example of how I do that. So this costume was designed for the 200, 200th anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade. And it was designed in 2007 and it's, it's entitled The Spirit of Emancipation. What we're looking at is the headdress, which actually was the key to the design. It represents the pain of the slaves, a bent over, arms tied. But it also, when you look at it, you see like a helmet, like a Roman helmet. They were fighters, they were strong. And because of their strength and because they were warriors, we, they, we were able to come out of slavery. And so the spirit of emancipation costume looked like this. We have three dancers that are captured by the masquerader. And so she performs like that with them captured. And then in the enactment, she releases them, she frees them. And they are able to dance, the dancers are moving and dancing. In the layers of meaning in this costume, we can see a number of things, not just the obvious three free dancers, but we also see things like the Trinity, which of course coming from Trinidad and with the, the, uh, the idea of the uh, emancipation of this and the abolition of the slave trade, that whole thing of Trinidad is very important to me. The Notting Hill Carnival has strong links to Trinidad and I am from Trinidad, so Trinidadian culture and, um, and ideologies and focuses and all of that is within, is underpins my work. So we have the Trinity, but we also have the crucifix in there, the crucifixion, the idea of the three, Jesus in between the two thieves. And we also have, when you look, the, the, the dancers actually designed as a cross. So, the, so there's so many layers of meaning within the one design, trying so hard to keep the message in, in, in the mass, but also in the performance, you know, it's just real. They're free, they're captured, and they're free. So I very much use Carnival to portray um, ideas like that. And, and I like to make sure that we're holding on to the truth of the heritage. That's how the heritage um, remains in our storytelling. And um, what was my next question? It was, uh, oh, what inspired me to create costumes? Um, well, actually, the first thing that inspired me to create costumes, when I came to England, I was 15 years old. And being a bit homesick, I did a, a little de design of, of a carnival costume. And I took it to my art teacher and said, look at this, being all excited and um, wanting her to say, wow, what's this? You know, how, why did you do that? And, this, and she didn't. She took one look at it and she said it was kitsch. And of course, I'm like, how does she know about Kitchener? But actually, she wasn't referring to Kitsch at all. She was her perception of Carnival is that it was cheap and tacky. And that really did upset me. And it just remained with me in the back of my mind that the, that the world has a perception of Carnival as being cheap and tacky. 
Um, and I really wanted my culture to not be viewed like that. And then the next thing that really inspired me was reading Errol Hill's book, The History of the Trinidad Carnival. Now that really opened my eyes because that book was discussing my personal heritage. I'm from Trinidad, I born and grew up there. And the things that he described in there, like the banning of the drum, that actually in doing the, that, they actually went and shot 13 people in a Hindu festival. Well, I could have been at that Hindu festival if it was in the 1800s, because we have in, in Indian families. So he talked about no more than 10 people of color being able to stand on street corners um, in those days. And I'm like, well, there wasn't even a pandemic then, and, and they couldn't, they weren't allowed to do to do things like that. And it was really, it, it just came alive. It brought carnival, it brought the context of carnival alive for me, and and it set the context for for way back at the beginning of the abolition of slavery, but it also set the context for you to watch how society changed and how carnival mirrors that, how the changes are reflected in the costumes and in the way in which we celebrate carnival today. Um, and so that's why I was inspired by carnival. I was then asked to talk about the process of making costumes. I've created a little picture for you. So when making costumes, first of all, I would begin with the drawing and everybody would begin with some kind of idea and your design. And, and, and once you've had your design, you then need to work out how we're we going to bring this design to life. So we tend to do a big plan of it on the floor. So you can see me there drawing the big plan on the floor because by drawing that big plan on the floor, I'm able to get all the measurements possibly the templates. I can work out how much fabric or materials I'm going to need to do it. That's, so that is the starting point apart from the concept and the idea. The other major thing is then once we've got the map, what materials are making the decision about the materials that you're going to use, really the, that brings is going to bring it to life. And that's another big thing. Are we going to use wire? Are we going to use fiberglass? How are we going to work with the fabric? Um, do we have enough resources to make it? Are we going to run out of material? So there's a whole big debate about the materials. And there's one thing I want to share with you about materials. You have to allow the materials to talk to you. Because when you make something with the material, you put some rods in, and it might do something quite different from what you preconceived. And that thing that the material did might really make a huge difference to making the work that you're doing very original and unique. And so allowing time to explore different possibilities is quite crucial to making original work. And from that, you get the templates. And then the next most important thing, I think, of making are those who actually do the making, the team. You need to surround yourself with the people with the ability to make the costume that you want to bring to life. You don't have to make it all, well, you could if you want to, but there are, you need to find those people. You need the right engineers with the right understanding about balance and fab and movement. You need to work with, with craftspeople, brilliant pattern cutters, and who are really good at sewing straight lines. <laughs> Otherwise you get crooked lines. Um, people who are good at painting. So I'm so fortunate to have uh, an amazing team of very talented, highly skilled um, artists who have worked with me for many, many years. Some started when they were seven, some started when they were 14, and we've still been working together for ages. Um, and, and that really helps you to add a layer of quality. And as your all your skills come together, there's a really wonderful sparky moment when you actually put the costume together and the guys who've been rotting and the guy who welded the thing and the person who made the headdress and the other person. And then the performer comes and adds the life. So we've been making the inanimate object. And when they come, it then has another life. And all the guessings that we've been going on the debates about make it like this, use that material. That's a completely different um, opportunity um, at that time when you see everybody's creative endeavor come together in one in a final amazing costume so the the team is really important and when i spoke about the where in in the bio the thing about working with communities that that really is a big and important 
central mm. key to building the team. People, children come and they learn and they stay and they perform and then they become the makers and then they have their children and their children. So the whole thing about making carnival have a heritage, passing on the traditions and passing on the skills. The mass camp is the home, the family, where you create the family, a community family that then can take, keep the traditions alive as, as they grow and as they take carnival forward. So that is um, part, a real key part of making costume. And the, my next question was, what was my favorite costume? And that was a very hard one because there's 30 years of making costumes for so many different kinds of things. And the way in which we do our costumes, you know, it might be that we get a job. So any of those things that was in India or wherever, we create stuff for that. That helps me to put those in the on back onto the street at carnival so i've been able to use budgets from other things to recreate and to develop things to a different level because we have been really so lucky and very grateful for for having resources to be able to work at a different kind of level and having a beautiful space to do so that's the other really key thing where do you make stuff that's so big how do you put it together if you don't have a, a space in which to do that so that's a key thing in terms of developing the resources to, to make carnival work and to stay. So I chose this one out of the blue. And I chose it because it's recently been in the forefront of our mind. We've been do, using this costume for, for a number of different things and it is really so beautiful. So it looks quite simple. It's not very big. It's, you see our masquerader, Carolyn, who's a terrific um, performer in her simple blue or blue out of the blue, out of the blue, where? Out of blue, you look at it. She wears a simple elegant dress, but out of the blue transforms. It opens and there's a complexity of other stuff going on. So where is the imagination? What is imagination? Where, how, why? You know, out of the blue, really? Is it really out of the, just from nowhere? And the answer to that, of course, is no, it's never from nowhere. It's in, you have you feed your imagination with inspiration from a whole range of different things. So with my cheeky self, I decided to have to to recreate a honeycomb. Well, I have to tell you, we certainly did learn a lot to have respect for bees. So you look at a bee and you look up and you see some an afro stuck on a tree. I think, oh, that's 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 a bee. Look closer, and then look closer again and see exactly how what is the intricacies of that amazing sculpture that is the hive. And then you realize how much we miss because we just look at the surface. And if you look again and you look below the surface, you will discover a re another world of incredible magic. So look, look again and look again at what you, will do, what you can discover. So out of the blue actually tells telling you that story as a simple little lady coming with her little dress. And as she opens it, the drama, you can hear the audience <gasps> and everybody's just waiting for her to open it again. When she got open again, <gasps> and every time she opens it, you can hear the audience. The audience is dying for drama. They want to be mesmerized and they want to be moved and they want to be surprised. And so we like to work in that. We like to create costumes that do that. So this was actually designed for within a theme that was called a stretch of the imagination. And it was designed in 2005. So we keep our costumes because we want to be able to use them. You know, after making this, I wasn't gonna throw it away. It took so long to make. And it really, really was a challenge to, to make that honeycomb work the way, we, the way we wanted it to, the way it needed to. So, so that is an incredible costume. And by looking at it, you can tell that there is an incredible skilled team of people who are cutting, who are sewing, who are rodding, who are making lovely dresses, with, who are making headpieces, who are making sure that when it goes out there, it will be a magical experience for everybody who actually sees it and experiences it. I once had a theme that was called Imagine This. <laughs> and that was because I kept thinking, you know, could we have, would we have wanted to fly if we had never seen a bird. And that's so for me, there is no, nature is really, really 
important and the beauty and it is so much a wonderful space for feeding the imagination as as we know from the scientists what they are discovering from nature is really quite key so so this is um my favorite costume how am i doing for time you are doing fine yeah another five minutes if that's okay lots of time okay so so out so that's how out of the blue um comes how we're devising and within the stretch of the imagination theme we actually were being abstract so we looked at just the circle as a form and we we expanded it and we opened it up and we made it 3d and this costume actually is has a circle with with two quarters taken out at the front and at the back so it's still uh, trying to understand different ways of exploring the circle and how your mind goes from one thing to the next to the next and and the idea of scaling up so you know if you look at a daisy you look inside the daisy you look in the center of the daisy but then look at a sunflower which actually is almost a really big daisy and what you see in the center that you can't see in the little daisy you can actually see very clearly in the center of the sunflower um, and so the stretch of the imagination looked at nature from all these abstract perspectives and our next question was about the future of carnival and and that really is quite a big question because um i think that caribbean carnivals have an op have the support of the of the governments because carnival through it, the tourism it generates has an enormous impact on the economies of the of caribbean islands and so carnivals in the caribbean have an opportunity i think to come back i think the governments are going to want them to come back um and to, to, we're going to find ways to kind of make that happen we have to do that very cautiously because what we don't want to do is we don't want to in to bring in port the virus again so we have to watch very carefully what's happening in other countries to see what how is the virus moving and how are they safely opening opening up events um so for example in grenada there's no virus in trinidad there was only seven cases so so the potential for carnival in the caribbean um is has has a really good potential to come back but there are but there are issues there and big issues to do with unemployment to do it should we open the borders maybe the carnivals have to be island-wide so maybe grenada and trinidad you know there may be ways in which the islands interact with each other and then we need to we may still need to be looking at how you engage internationally without having a physical presence so what we have gained in having virtual experiences over this year, I think we'll continue to offer real opportunity for collaboration across the world without necessarily having to be in the space. Um, the other issue is for carnivals in the diaspora. Well, that's a different issue. And that's a different issue because, because the economies out in the other nations do not rely on us. So, but we need their their support and there is a huge problem at the moment and i know already that the in, that the costs of the infrastructure for carnivals out in the diaspora is so enormous for some carnivals that actually that already there have been cuts made so carnivals are actually producing work carnivals are producing work but to present their work how can they do that if they don't have the infrastructure so we do have to spend time looking for new ways to present work that doesn't require a whole a huge police presence and that doesn't require huge road closures and things that are so very costly so i think the big game changer is actually poverty and deprivation because i think that um i would hate to think that covid would steal the childhood from our communities 
and we just cannot let that happen. The arts and the crafts of carnival offer a great experience to, to help with isolation and to help with generating a, a sense of well-being when you make something lovely. You've, there's a social, a lovely social <clears throat> experience that happens in the making of beautiful things. And carnival, especially in um, in the UK and the way we do it, is really so much about for the people, by the people, and with the people. That looking ahead, I have I I am searching for every way to ensure that no one is not able to participate in carnival. That we find we have to find ways to enable for carnival not to be about being able to buy your costume but ways in which you will be able to participate in carnival, regardless of whether you can afford to or not. And I think then I so that is something that we do need to look at because carnival has been the access route for arts for a lot of people. And so, and so we, and we need to maintain that. We cannot have a lost generation of, of, of people who have not had that access to the arts. Um, and so we will be, we're looking for how we can make sure that the arts carries on and I can say that the artists of Luton are, are working away feverishly in their homes to create their carnival costumes. And as an organizer, I'm, I'm trying to work out the best way to enable them to present that. We will have a virtual aspect. I think going forward, all carnivals will maintain that virtual aspect. But I think that there will be, we need to look at so many different ways of how we have carnival experiences. One of those ways we did this this year, we had care home carnival. So we took carnival to the care homes because they suddenly couldn't come out. So, and it was so moving to see the, the expressions of the elderly who was so appreciative of seeing something that is as magnificent as, carnival, as the carnival costumes that we all create. So for me, we're looking at the, the idea of, UKCCA is looking at the idea of a national children's carnival with schools, because schools will be a space where people will be able to actually have costume and to perform them. And that would mean that children, irregardless of, of your social standing, will be able to have a, a carnival experience and to bring that joy and that creativity that carnival, carnival is so brilliant at doing. So that's where we're, where we're working at the moment. Um, and I think that in the Caribbean, when I came to the UK, I, my children were able to learn steel pan in school. And uh, I, we were able to access, and so still I'm talking about the national schools, Carl, there's so much was happening that was being done by Caribbean people in the UK. But when I was growing up, I couldn't access steel pan in school. And I think that we have a, we have a potential to have an international children's celebration to ensure that the next generation has carnival in their blood as they grow up and and to, and that they're inspired by that through the way that they the, amount, the, the way that you can learn from carnival and as i said before we can't let covid steal childhood uh is that enough <laughs> so that that's um that's where I'm at with with how what the future of carnival could possibly be. Is there more time? Oh no, that that's fine. Thank you so much. Thank you so so much. I don't know if Isaac is still there. Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you can't probably can't see me because I all I can see is that. Uh, clear your screen at the I moment but that was amazing share. thank you so so much shall i stop share yes please um could everyone give a i know we're all at home but uh <laughs> a little bit of applause to Clary. that was absolutely fantastic um and i think it really highlights the brilliant the power and the importance of um mass and the culture that we have and i don't think people i think it's something we i guess in general we speak about it but I don't think we remember the effort that goes in to creating um, the rememorialization of centuries worth of ancestry it's a it's a huge art form and I think it's a big thing that 
we need to speak about in general but I think in particular when carnival returns because of you know coronavirus has stopped I think that is the big narrative I think that needs to be at the forefront that mm. you know you've had creators who have been at home for a long while um and you know we've had artists haven't been able to share the art so thank you so much for all that you do um you are really appreciated thank you so much thank you um, right, I uh, would like to introduce Mimi Rodriguez, a contemporary art historian, editor, and administrator focused on art democratization and the viability of art production by and about minority groups. Um, she is from Puerto Rico, and it's all yours. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Marsha. Um, I'll do my best to keep this as brief as possible, yet insightful for you guys. Um, by the way, Alexander and Clary, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sing. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have a few images so you can guys, guys can keep up with what I'm saying. Give me a quick second. Of course. Let me find you and make you a co-host as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. Yeah, okay. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, there we are. So let's and start. As everything in this side of the world, carnivals in the Caribbean have a complicated origin. So it's tied to colonialism, religious conversion, and ultimately freedom and celebration. As we know, the festival were started in, in Europe by the Catholics and it later spread throughout the European co um, colony. But it wasn't until the end of the slavery that people could finally celebrate their native culture and their emancipation through dress, music, dancing, and art. And those very elements are the ones that remain central to the carnival celebrations in the Caribbean. And for most of us, when we speak of Caribbean culture, even when it is more complex than that, we often think about partying. And for example, Puerto Rico, which is the smallest of the, of the greater Antilles, we take pride in having like the longest holidays ever. Because we start Christmas like on November and they last like 45 days. And it, it includes Thanksgiving Day, Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, the Three Kings Day, then we have like an eight day bonus. It's called Las, Las Octavitas. And we just keep eating and dancing for those eight days. And then we have a festival in honor of St. Sebastian in a street with that same name. So, so we know about even if it's just for fun. Um, but we have to consider that in Puerto Rico, we have a, a very deep cultural and racial mix. For a little bit of context, um, Puerto Rico was a Spanish colony. Then we became a United States colony, we still are. And that status has recently been reinforced by the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, which no as promesa, and it stands for promise in Spanish. And that is a federal law that established a financial control board on Puerto Rico so they can repay the creditors. But that includes cuts in the healthcare, pension, and education budgets. So we have like a, a complex political status here right now in the island. But anyhow, going back to the culture and the festivities, we have the Ponce Carnival, which is the 
longest and the older festivity we have. Ponce is a, a town in the south of the island. Let me see here. This is Ponce. It was founded in 1692. It became a village in 1848 and finally a city in 1877. So we have this celebration that lasts one entire week and it ends Wednesday. It's profoundly Catholic tradition. Um, we don't have like an exact date for it when, when it first started, but it said that it's even from the 1700s, but it was not until the 1950s that the government added the parade to the carnival. So the carnival begins on Wednesday and they have this local characters that are the, the, the one that go ahead, everything fun and colorful, the music and the dance. We, we are fond of salsa and bomba. So we have the King Momo. King Momo is the one that, the, by the tradition, is the one that fight the demons, which are the vejigantes. And the King Momo has queens that are crowned during the festival. And we have the ball. And at the end of the week, the carnival ends with the burial of the sergeant. It's a very performative act. They literally burn a, a sergeant. And this mock funeral is in honor of the coming season of Lent because it represents that the sins of the flesh are being burned so we can prepare to the land period, you know? And these carnivals, it's so very important that even during the pandemic, there were, there were needed some adjustment, but can't... Anyhow, let me show you another picture. This is the Vejigante, the demons I was talking about earlier. And this is how the carnival was presented this year. Instead of the people going to the town and see the carnival, the carnival went to the people. They did a caravan and with all the characters, and the king, the queen, everybody, that they just go all around the, the town so people could be safe but they didn't lose the tradition. As I told you before, we have a lot of festivities and traditions in the island, and they're all very similar. And for example, we have another carnival, Iloisa, which is at the northern east coast of the, of the island. And there, this carnival is in our, and they have very similar Things with the Ponce Carnival, they, ha they have a team, they have the gentlemen, they have the elders, and they have the vejigantes. The vejigantes, as I told you, they represent demons, but it is mainly a folkloric figure that needs... I'm sorry, do you hear me well? I, I hear like a feedback or something. I don't know if someone is unmuted. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead. We can hear you just fine. Okay, I'm sorry for that. So over time, the Vigigante became a very personal cultural expression to Puerto Rican, specifically in Loiza and Ponce. But even though they have the same name, they're not elaborated the same way. These are Loisa de Gigantes. And we can see that, that the mask is the same. This one is the Ponce um, mask. And this one is the Loisa one. The Loisa one is made out of coconut, bamboo, and flesh. Well, the, the Ponce one is made out of paper and glue. 
also the Ponce de Gigantes, they're like tricky and they're fun and they go all over the town, like pushing people and laughing and doing jokes. They, they're kind of, of naughty. Well, the de Eloisa de Gigantes, de Eloisa Demons, even though they need to look fearless, they, they're more like dancing. And even though the celebration itself has roots in Catholicism, the traditions are mixed with indigenous and African influences of the island. And to this day, this theme is still relevant in Puerto Rican artist work. So I'm gonna show you some of my personal favorites about the Gigante. This one is called um, Psychoanalysis of the Gigante by Rafael Tufino in 1971. These um, paints reflect the cultural decadency in Puerto Rico because in this time it was a war and the, there was an economic crisis, it still is. So these artists decided to pick the Vejigante as the representation of Puerto Ricans. And he painted him sad on the floor with some blue tones to reflect the, the feeling of the whole town. Then I'm gonna show you this culture. We have this culture to this day. And I like this one very much for a lot of reasons. First is in public space. So it's a constant reminder that we have traditions and the, that we have Afro roots that we also respect and venerate. And because technically it really represents the Loisa aesthetic. You know, I told you before that Ponce and Loisa Mas were different. And this one is in the Loisa town. It was made by Daniel Lin. He is a very prominent artist and we him very much here. And finally, there is our very own Marsha X, who is a Puerto Rican American artist working with installation, performance, painting, and filming, and to whom I'll be forever grateful for inviting me here. And there are practice and research is a development of what they call the existential cultural of women of color experience in the diaspora. So at the end of the day, we can conclude that carnivals are a manifestation of a cultural pluralism among the participants. And definitely the ongoing pandemic and the new style it has sprung upon us has been tough. So I believe studying the tradition and it's many manifestation of it may ease a little bit the isolation because there's always a reason to celebrate and we should definitely find a new and safer, safer way to do it. Afia, how are we on time? We are good for time. Shall we go into the, uh, shall we go into the question and answer section? But before we do, oh my gosh, <laughs> we give a massive, massive clap for me <laughs> because that was amazing. <laughs> and beautiful and I mean repeating island for real like Marcia you, the, you that book it's just so obvious when you look at the beautiful Hispano-Caribbean designs and oh yeah just absolutely beautiful thank you for that thank you so much thank you Marcia and I look. <laughs> no thank you guys <laughs> um yeah Isaac do you want to um throw the first question in 
or or yes. I can't, so um, no, I saw Claudette's question. Um, apologies, um, and it's for Clary. How do you buy your costume design drawings? I'm going to keep asking until one day you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> they're not for sale. <laughs> I tell you why they're not for sale. Because um, because I have kept all my designs and all my as much of my costumes as I can. Because if I don't do that, Notting Hill Carnival will have no real heritage. So you mm. can walk into Mahogany and see the first Mahogany Carnival design, the winning king of Notting Hill Carnival, 1989. That's really important because in the next 50 years, he will be an, an, a very important symbol of what we did do back then. And, 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 and most people, with the exception of one other artist that I know, Lawrence Noel, who actually brought the first carnival band in Notting Hill, there's not a lot of, of their work left. So that so, they, so we don't know exactly what they use, what they made. And Lawrence, actually, Lawrence Noel, a Trinidadian, was amazing at keeping his work. And many of the people who, who met Lawrence became, be, became designers because when you walked into his house, there were all these amazing costumes that he had made. And I need to share a story about Lawrence. Lawrence said the first state costume that he made in Notting Hill, he was working inside the house and he's making his lovely costume. And then it was Carnival Day. And then when they looked, they couldn't get it through the door. Lawrence said they took the windows out of the front room to take the costume to Carnival through the windows. And that, that stuck with me as to how important your culture is, that you would demolish part of your house for your art. Um, and he, he did keep his, his, uh, his thing. So, so, that, so that always again stuck with me. If I hadn't seen his work, I wouldn't have the same understanding or appreciation of Carnival that I have now. And because I was not in Trinidad from the age of 15, I was not in Trinidad. I didn't see Carnival. So my Carnival making experience is in London. Seeing his work was really, really important. And so I, I have to hold on to originals, but I'm quite happy to give you a print. Not, I can give you a print, Claudette. <laughs> so, so it's really important to have that collection, I think. Um, so that's the reason why I don't give away um, the drawings and I don't sell the costumes either. I let people use them, we let we hire them out and then I keep them. So we can use them. So if we have to do an exhibition, I have to do a big show. I can do a show with 300 costumes in five days. Wow. I have to be able to, and that helps me to take the, the, the culture forward. Yeah, I think um, archiving things like that are super important so that it doesn't get lost so that people always have a, a place to return to for the, inspiration and you know passing of the torch if you will so that's um yeah I, there was um kind of a question about um the 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 costumes um will you please say something about the amazing work you're doing on the green agenda showing your respect for the environment and the earth's future um on the well first of all we have done a lot of work with Greenpeace. We, have, we make costumes. Uh, the most successful campaign that we did with them was the orangutans for, it was about uh, saving the forest in, in um, well, saving the forest for the orangutans. And, uh, and Lee Unilever actually on the back of having the orangutans storm the outside of their buildings and all the press reports, actually did agree to remove the palm oil from Kit Kat and number of the of the different products that they produce. Um, and in Carnival, when I collaborated with them, we did a, a, a band that was called Awake. Be Awake, get up, see what's happening around you. <clears throat> and the end of that band, it was all about climate change. And the last part of that was the melting ice. And we had been working with Greenpeace on a campaign to save the Arctic. And so they have this amazing um, puppet of a polar bear puppet, which they brought to Carnival with us. And it really is very realistic. And there were quite a few people who were terrified that it 
how did the zoo let us have the <laughs> why did the zoo let them have have that polar bear that that's not on you know that kind of thing but of course it was a puppet so so that work with greenpeace is really important we also had an impact on gm food for chickens we made 60 chickens who went and stormed the silos um at, to raise the awareness of <clears throat> of gm food for chickens which actually is then gm food coming direct to us so working with organizations like that using carnival to bring the message to life actually does make a difference. So that's one way in which we're affecting. And the other way which we're affecting is we're, we're looking uh, and collaborating with, with other carnival organizations, looking at how we can create a greener environment. So our, our footprint, you know, can we reduce the size of the trucks? Can, and we're looking at how can we have electric vehicles and how can we have electric generators? so we can be reducing so if you think about what energy it takes to put on train that kind of all those trucks all those sound systems all of those and when you look at what's happening with technology how everything is actually getting smaller so you can have a really tiny thing speaker that's pushing out huge sound you know so we we need to look at all of those things and how the energy is coming and how can we so it might be that who knows next time you've got um solar panels on the top of the trucks you know, so we need to be clever. We in Trinidad, we've got nice sunshine and everybody needs to look at the energy that they're, that they're consuming and, and be thinking about how we can reduce what, what we're in, what's happening there. And so there's discussions going on with groups and experiments into creating electric generators that still push out the same sound. That's an ongoing thing. Yes, can I just add that um, there was a conference last March in Bristol, just about that. In fact, it was towards a greener carnival, as a consequence of which I wrote my song, Carnival's Going Green. But we discussed those very things, pedal power and electric vehicles and trucks, non-diesel trucks, all of that. And um, we're on the same path anyway. I mean, you're doing it with masks, I'm doing it with music. Very, very important to be environmentally sound these days. Absolutely. Yeah. Link to that uh, question is a, a really interesting one that's come up next. And it's uh, a really important one about affordability of costumes and um, obviously linked to, I guess, the future of Carnival, you know, it being environmentally friendly and, and uh, sustainable. And in terms of people in the Caribbean who create Carnival costumes or are involved in Carnival in any way, how do we maintain those jobs? Anyone can answer that. I think that's a bit of a general question. Well, it's a tough one. I mean, earlier on, as Clary was pointing out, in the Caribbean, we tend to have sort of things um, and are happy just to go out scantily dressed with some feathers and bits and pieces. So in some respects, it's almost like the designers don't need to design as much anymore. You're in a kind of minority, Clary, a fantastic minority, but as you know, maybe you could talk more about that. It's quite difficult because I haven't been to Carnival for such a very long time. Actually, I'm a Parangdira, so I tend to go for Christmas. Um, and and as you say, you know, I don't find um, I can see that there is an issue about the Carnival team, but I think that it's highly likely that those can't those jobs are very seasonal, and and they start in October and then they end in February and then they probably come back again. So so I th I think that carnival people have skills and that are transferable and that if you're very skilled that you need to then look at the industries that require those skills so one of the things that made me very sad was to think that we were importing things in trinidad from china and even here in the uk we're doing that and those things are things that could have been made in trinidad via, via a local industry so if you had to do embroidery to make the to make the motifs then why aren't we making that in trinidad and now that there are no jobs for then why aren't we creating that industry instead of in bringing the spending the money outside of trinidad so i think that, that the carnival community needs to look at itself and needs to think about what it requires and maybe some of those things can happen in trinidad to maintain or create the jobs and the industry that may not take. So maybe we could be supplying motifs made in the Caribbean to everywhere else instead of bringing it in from outside. 
um, we need to we need to start looking at looking to be self sufficient like that. And then the other thing is when I speak about other industries, you know, if you're a metal worker, well, go start making cars, go work, make gates, and look at the companies where where that skill um, is necessary. Form a new company. I started a carnival company because the grants for the theater companies that I worked with were cut. So if I didn't start Carnival, I wouldn't be a designer today because all the work just disappeared when when the when the funding was cut. Um, so you you have transferable skills. If you if you're a seamstress and you're making stuff, then there are places that are making. Go join a factory that's making fashion stuff and start your own label, fashion label, and make things that then are, are local. Um, and so that that's what I think. I feel I feel that we need to be more local with it, and and that's where that whole thing about deprivation and poverty has a role to play because the fact that you don't have money doesn't mean you can't be creative. And in London, what we benefit from is the thing about volunteering. So anybody who volunteers with me will be one of the first people to get a job from anything that comes up. I'm calling on them. So I would say any carnival person in, in anywhere in the world who is unemployed, go and look at the communities and, and the businesses that use your skill, making airplane seats, make sewing shirts for uniforms, <clears throat> making PPE. That's one of the first things we did in order to pro protect the jobs of the freelance artists who worked with me. We just said, we've got to do something. So we made, we made um, <clears throat> scrubs. Of, uh, we didn't make a lot, but we did make scrubs. <clears throat> For, for the hospital, so because those are transferable skills. And so, and that is what I think we need to say to, to carnival jobs that seem to have disappeared. <clears throat> you have a skill, your skill is the key to your career, build on it. Yes, and actually the things about those skills are the quality, people will pay for quality, and you'll find small cottage industries that make beautiful linen or beautiful clothes, Will always thrive because there will always be somebody who wants to buy something of real quality rather than just off the peg where there are thousands of things so that is i mean that is definitely a good piece of advice there from you and just, also you see i used to actually buy leotards from trinidad <clears throat> just so i can so i can help to sustain what's going on there so if you can make things like that even if you're a small person these these days with the internet there's no reason if you make something even in a small little country place in in Trinidad, you can put that stuff out on the Internet and people can order it from you and then and you can have your little business in Trinidad. So we need to move with the times and you've got to use the Internet to publicize your ability and set yourself up as an independent maker, little business and, and start negotiating with all the other carnivals around the world. Because, and the other industries, film industry, theater industry, everybody. Um, so that's what I think. I think it's an opportunity for to grow small micro businesses. Indeed. I just want to come in with something I saw Claudette put in about Jean Canu. It reminded her the, um, the, the wonderful Puerto Rican um, um, celebrations, reminded her of Jean Canu. And of course, we've talked about carnival being coming out of the, the, the Catholic church practices, but of course, um, in those islands which weren't particularly Catholic, Jean Canu was all about Christmas really, and also Cropover is about the, the Harvest Festival, which is very much a Protestant thing, if like an Anglican thing. And so carnivalesque happens at every stage. And actually you mentioned Parang earlier, and I'm just thinking of Morelli, um, we, because Trinidad is only seven miles from Venezuela, we have an awful lot of stuff that we've imported from Venezuela. I don't mean imported in goods, but we have the cuatro, which is a mm. Venezuelan instrument, but thousands of Trinidad play it. And we have paranda, you'd have called it paranda, but we can now call it parang, which are Christmas songs, that wonderful um, tradition of going from house to house where you're playing guitars, shack shack, flutes, violins. You're not allowed to play brass. You can't play brass instruments. But if any of you check out, um, Daisy Voisin, spelled V-O-I-S-I-N. She does Alegria, Alegria, these wonderful, fantastic Christmas songs that are all part of the season that goes from Christmas all the way up to Carnival, to Lent, if you like. So I think where we've mentioned the, the, the Catholic Church before, it's actually Caribbean-wide, whatever 
the 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 Christian beliefs are. It doesn't matter. The tradition is there. It's in the people. Mento, Jamaican Mento, is just calypso, but done in Jamaica. Now it's been superseded, of course, by reggae and things like that. But that's just been in the tradition. It was all much of a muchness. And we've got to remember also, particularly in Trinidad, where we are very multicultural, the indentured Indians and also the Chinese that came after the ending of slavery, they brought their culture with them. We have huge um, festival, the festival of Jose, we call it Jose, it was originally Hossein, that you, where you get tassa drumming. Again, I'm talking music here, but where the Indian traditional um, practices, not only music, but also dance, have been brought in and mixed up with, and we have these different sorts of cultural um, expressions which are shared across the board. Whether you're of African origin, Indian origin, whatever, we like everything about that carnivalesque experience. And that's why we have things like chutney soca and chutney, which obviously is, a, obviously is an Indian thing. It's, um, it's expanded. People are, they love, we're like magpies. We love things that shine. And when mm. I say shine, I'm using it in a metaphorical way. A song can shine, a piece of, you know, a sound can shine. And, and like magpies, we say, I like that. How do you do that? Tell me, show me. Where do you get that costume? It's that curiosity that makes us all share this fabulous thing called carnival. Really, you haven't said much. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, indeed. I completely agree about all those things that we share in so much different cultures and about the shining thing and about the, the carnivalesque um, aspect that we all love. I'm looking forward for people to keep reinventing um, the carnivalesque aesthetic. You know, I think it, it's time for that. I think, I think it's a need. And we can work on that. That was actually a question that I had for you was where do you, I mean, we see like the gigantes in um, like Daniel Lin's work, it pops up a little bit. Um, Awila Sterling did that wonderful performance, the gigante de crepito. So it's, it's consistently summoned and used in art, but I just wondered where you thought not just carnival, but in particular the gigantes, which are a massive part of carnival if you think it's still evolving and it's still anchored or if you think um or if you think it's not you know just your sort of your general assessment of that part of um uh, puerto rican culture specifically i guess yeah well thank you for that actually when i was doing the research and getting information all together um there's a lot of things still we can talk about from punk but one thing that I, I want to investigate a little bit more is um, I'm from Ponce. So I know the Vigan says from Ponce, I've been there my whole life. And I remember when I was a kid, I wanted to be dressed as a Vigante, but they were always like, oh no, that's for boys. Men, men are the Vigantes only. And I think the, the gender um, aspect through the Vigante and through how you can have fun and how you can be demon and stuff like the discussion that we we need to have and even though in the artistic manifestations um we have seen more male artists talking about the gigantes and female artists and female black artists it's only a will and you so i think the gigantes are still relevant and i think um the afro origin of the gigantes it's more relevant We have a question here. Um, staying on the topic of bikini mas versus traditional mas, how as extremely experienced practitioners and beacons of knowledge of carnival, would you say you engage young people, teenagers specifically, who perhaps aren't as in touch with their culture nor the arts or don't have access by default to carnival? Um, Well, I suppose that's the question. How do you engage young people with Carnival right now who have a difficult time um, accessing it? By running, I run eight weeks of open workshops where they can just walk in 
um, and, fire, and, and join in in the making or in the performance and and a lot of what we do what i do is with them out so i encourage families to bring families so if somebody comes and joins i say so hey where's your sister where's your brother where's your cousins what's going on yeah everybody who comes has to bring somebody else so so we, we create a community of people who actually know one another and families um and and also by selecting themes that have a relevance so for example, when it was the 2008, Britain got to the Olympics, the theme for Carnival that year was bling. Mm -hmm. you know, what does bling have to do with the Olympics? Well, it has everything to do with the Olympics. If you are in Harlesden and you're, you're a youngster and you've got your trousers down below your bum and you've got a big rock in your ear, the rock in your ear is bling and your identity is that urban image. <laughs> so, so the whole thing about bling was to take the idea of the Olympics and put it in the hands of these young people with graffiti and big gems. And so you have to design stuff that, that resonates they, with young people. They wanted to come and draw those big, and what were the words? Ingenious, amazing, achieve, you know, so you, so you have to find, use your carnival to speak to children, to young people, and in a way that they actually, uh, you know, they want, they actually accept that. The other thing is that the design, you know, you think that, that people really want to only wear naked things, but actually when the kids come in and I've got my drawings on the wall, in very, I have a problem in that there's about three designs on the wall and they all want to be in it but that's an adult section. So they can't be in it because they're young people. They need to be in the kids section, but they don't want to be in the kids section. And so a lot of the people who actually perform for mahogany, you know, they are starting at the age of 13 and 14. They're big, they're big enough to wear any of the big costumes and they want the big costumes. I have had somebody say to me, when is the queen going to die so I can get a chance to be the queen? <laughs> so, you know, that is the degree of, of of the expectation of the desire to actually be one of the big special costumes don't underestimate that people only want that and so we cater for anybody who wants there are lots of people out there doing bikini masks you want bikini masks good plenty to choose from because we are not doing that we're doing what we're doing you want to, to have that content you want to make a difference in the things that you wear and and so everybody's looking special whether you're in feathers or not you're still special but we just do it in a different way and uh and the young people love it they choose what's on the wall i don't make them choose they come in and they choose and they bring their families and their friends so the theme is really really important because also because we do have that message you know young people do want to say to make the point they have they have things to say too, and when if they're part of my brushstrokes, and they bring when they see the whole thing to life, and once they've done it once, and they've seen the band stand up on the side, and they've seen my gosh, wow, well, look at that, you know that you can't you can't buy you can't bottle that <laughs> and sell it to them. They they have to experience it, and and their families see that. So parents bring the little kids who start at seven but are still part of mahogany and they're 30 now or they're 20 or whatever. So parents have a, a lot to play with starting kids, which is why I really focus on, on the little kids. So if they can be inspired by seeing amazing big things that's relevant and appropriate for children, I'm hoping that that nurtures that appetite for work that is in, within that style. I, I hope that's a reasonable answer. I wanted to ask as well, um, do you see, um, in the, at least in the Caribbean itself now, the more traditional forms of mass, are they still going? Obviously it gets overshadowed by, I guess, the more modern forms of carnival. Um, but do you still see a lot of the traditional things apparent, at least in the Eastern Caribbean uh, and the Eastern Southern Caribbean? Well, I've on the three, four occasions I've been to Dominica during carnival time, it's very beautifully traditional. They wear the madras, which is the, you know, the various, the, the, the colorful um, headdresses and all, and, and, and the clothes and things. And all the banks 
all their staff dress that way and they do Jinping and various kinds of, of musical variations. They, are, they play Zouk, they play Cadence, the different things there. So they go traditional. Dominica has a very strong um, calypso and um, all, all the other musical forms really from the Eastern Caribbean. Um, and it, it goes traditional in a very big way there. I've also found that in Trinidad, uh, when they have Cambule, which is, um, well, they, they, they reenact the Cambule riots in Juve. For those of you who don't know, Juve is the opening of the day. So it's basically the Monday morning, usually at two or three in the morning, um, the opening of the day for the two days of carnival. And they enact it downtown, um, I say downtown in Port of Spain, but they also do it in, in I think, San Fernando too. And they dress very much in traditional costumes. They do the, the jab jabs, they do the, the various characters you can see from the old mass. I mean, there are people like, there, there, there are characters like, um, apart from Fancy Sailor, they have all these names. Clary would know many more than I do, but I know there, there's also Wild Indian. Now, Wild Indian is like the Native American Indian with the headdresses and stuff. And the reason that character is there is because when the um, slaves in America, the early ones certainly saw the Native Americans fighting back, they admired them for the fact that they didn't put up without fighting strongly. So for, from the point of view of the slaves, wow, these guys, they're not taking it on the chin, they're going back and, and trying to do their thing. So they became a, a, char a character within Carnival whom they admired. Interestingly enough, the um, buffalo soldiers, which is what Africans looked like when they fought on, on, on the side of the, um, the North, I suppose, in the Civil War, that was a name given to them by the Indians, by the Native Americans. They were known as buffalo soldiers because of their hair, which made them look like buffaloes. So there's a wonderful cross reference there between two different cultures, both, if you like, fighting the white um, enemy as such. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's what I'm gonna, that's what I can say about that. But I think that the Cambole, which is the burning of the canes, the Cambole riots were when they, when the slaves or the ex-slaves set the, um, the fields, the, the, the sugar plantation fields alight in protest. And that is, that is sort of remembered every year and celebrated as resistance as a form of resistance against the slave plantation owners and the slave owners. So again, um, that is where you would see traditional masks and traditional costumes. And I remember going one year, I can't remember, it was about 95 or 97, and they have a particular spot, a, a part of Port of Spain where they do the old masks. And I remember going there and seeing um, Derek Walcott walking around and watching what was going on there. And of course, he's one of the two um, Nobel laureates of Caribbean literature. Um, he was just strolling around there, um, watching all the stuff going on, very, very interested in the traditional costumes and the traditional masquerade, the, the, the various characters mm. that are part and parcel of the old masks. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Ah, no. uh, there is one, um, and I did have it myself as well. Um, Clary, how can we find your workshops? Because that'd be really good to put out on social media. Mm. Yeah, I was just trying to remember all of our hashtaggy things. Well, um, it's it's a bit difficult right now because we're watching what the government is saying to work out how we can come back. Um, and so, your best bet would be to. Um, look at, our, see what's happening off, keep an eye on our Facebook and our Instagram, because as we start, we will put stuff out, out like that and, and our website, which is mahoganycarnival.com. We will, we, there will be notices on there and you can actually send an email to us via our website if you want to, to know what's happening. But usually, um, we start our workshops in July and they run right through August. But if the carnival is virtual, then the likelihood of whenever that film is happening will be 
in the beginning of August. And that will dictate when that our workshops will then happen earlier. So right now, it's quite difficult to say to you exactly. So my advice to you is just contact me because I do a lot of one-to-one -one work. And when we can't have big groups, we will work in a one-to-one -one way. So by all means, send me a message on Instagram, send us a message on Facebook and we will respond. And, and you can definitely come and work with us on whatever we're doing at that time. And, it, and, and I really can't answer exactly what it is now, but usually it's July right towards the end of August with the celebrate with Carnival at the end. Um, and we're just a little bit in limbo. Not a very good answer, but it's the best I can do right now. But you could definitely call me, get in touch. It's no problem. Happy to help and, and advise on anything that you want to do or that you are doing. Um, we're here to help and we, we have an open door. But of course, now we're socially distancing and all of that. So reach out to me and I'll find a way to see how, how we can work together. Thank you so much, Clary. I was going to say to all the panelists, if you do want to put your social media details or uh, any kind of contact details that you're comfortable with in the chat box, please do, because the work you're all doing is amazing and extremely important. So thank you so, so much. Do we have any further questions at all? I have one um, for Clary. It's more about if, say, Carnival, which is there's a possibility of it. I know people have been vaccinated and everything, but mass gatherings are different to just meeting your friends. So um, if it is virtual, you know, do you in Mahogany have any plans to do anything for um, uh, sort of, I guess, how children are being educated via Zoom at the moment in part? So any kind of, you know, Zoom workshops and things like that. And the reason I say it is just because I was thinking of my godson and my younger cousins, and I thought it'd be a really good thing, especially for a lot of... Um, uh, black children in the UK in particular to get involved in in the summer while well, obviously they'll be on holiday as well. Well, what we're doing at the moment at the UK Centre for Carnival Arts, we are collaborating with about eight different and, and as many carnivals in the UK as we can to set up a, ch a national children's carnival schools programme so that we would be able to work with schools and just think of it like this. The best time for everybody, for children and for the schools, because the teachers have been under so much pressure, for them to be able to do anything to do with carnival would be right at the end of term. And so if every carnival in every region engaged their schools at the end of term, that's when we know the children and the teachers would be able to take it on board. That was the impetus for thinking, boy, this is a national thing. Well, it could be an international thing because everybody could just be, be looking at the resources and jump on and create stuff. So already what we had been doing, we had focused a lot on children, knowing that there was this deprivation going on at home and everything. So we were making small, simple paper making exercises uh, that you can see on the website for different age groups. So there's something for the wind rush, there's something on friendship, there's something um, to do just with fish, things that, so there's simple things that children would love to make. And some of them you can do out on your own without needing a parent, depending on how old you are. And some of them are a little bit more complicated. What we didn't do was a lot of Zoom stuff because we felt that, bec because I'm a coward. <laughs> <laughs> that was the one because uh, I didn't. I'm, I'm really not a great techie, but we did create two um, Zoom workshops. One was for panelists, um, and so there's a workshop there, and and we also did a workshop for for Brent um, for the Brent Museum. So there's a there's a live workshop, and the links to those are on our website. And at the UK Centre for Carnival Arts, we've been doing the same thing. We link, we've been linking the work into the celebrations of communities because that is central also to what we do. So we work for, with communities for Chinese New Year. So you go on, you will find stuff to do with Chinese New Year on the website. We do stuff to do with the Asian community. So you go and you'll see that we've done something for Diwali um, and, and we work like that. We help communities to, to bring to life their experience. And that gives us, uh, a wonderful, united, harmonious community that we work with, representing everybody somehow. So, so visit the UK Center for Carnival Arts. That's um, carnivalarts.org. Uh, or .uk. I need to I'll put that in the chat as well. The UK Center for Carnival Arts. 
Carnival Arsenal all the UK. And if you go on there, you see a lot of paper. There's a lovely steel how to make a steel band headdress. Um, and and it, and if you learn just to make that simple thing with paper, you will be able to transform it by adding other things and but just using that other thing that works on the head. And there's several different ways you will see across the both websites how those work. There's so much learning for young people who can then be creative with that, with the understanding that they get just from working in paper. Everything you can make in paper, that's how I began. And everything you can make in paper and cardboard, you can also make with wire or foam or the other, or the other things. So just that learning of making this and following step mm -hmm. by step will, will really be helpful to children and teachers. We're trying to make topics that fit into the curriculum as well. So watch this space. Wow, thank you so much. Do we have any more questions at all? Um, no, but I found it. So worried I wasn't gonna find this. I am putting a link to a YouTube video. Um, now it's in Spanish. So if you don't speak Spanish, apologies, because I do not think there's any captions. Um, it's called Nenen de la Ruta Mora. Do you know this one, that that film, Mimi? Yes, I know it. <laughs> Sorry. You know, okay, yeah. So this film um, was put together. Oof, is it the fifties? Yeah, nineteen fifty-five, um, and it's a film about a gigante. And what's really amazing about this film is it shows you Black Puerto Ricans. And it all, but it also shows you Black Puerto Ricans making the gigante mask and the costume. Um, and I, I don't know how many people have seen this or engaged with this kind of um, historical work, but uh, I think it's important for me to kind of stress how often Black people in the Hispano Caribbean are consistently erased um, and spoken yeah. over or dispersed in some way it's so it's you know it's an erasure on paper um and it, i it's for me out of respect for people from my country it's important to make sure that we see them that they exist <laughs> and, you know the culture didn't come from anywhere it's it's kind of frustrating to see people say well our ancestors were african but there are people who are african puerto rican now that exist today so um this is just a, a really beautiful film to look at visually as well, um, to see this. It's just, it's great. So I, I highly recommend it for anyone who's, who's interested. It's not necessarily about a carnival, but it's about a boy and the local vejigante. So um, that's in the chat. And yes, also- Thank you so much in, for that, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a very, it's a wonderful film, but there's also a lot of information. So if anyone who's obviously a guest wants to note this stuff in this chat box, because once the um, video ends, then it's going to go, the information is going to go as well. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you, sorry, were you going to say, were you going to say anything? I was One gonna say thing I was going to very quickly recommend, I've done it for people. If you're on a phone or you're on your laptop, it's just to go through all the links that you see and just click them open and your phone will open them or your laptop will open them. And then you'll have them so you can kind of copy and paste them and store them. Thank you, Mar uh, Marcia. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, I was gonna say to Marcia, thank you for that and I, I just remember that Marcia, hopefully we can do a session on music in the Caribbean at some point, because I remember Marcia had given us a, this really, some information on this really great, I think Puerto Rican rapper who kind of speaks about social issues. So I look forward to us doing a session on music, but unless, oh, it seems that we have one more, I think we might have time for one more question. Yeah, so the record, the, there will be a recording. We're working on websites and different social media pages. Uh, you'll have to be patient with us because we, me especially, I have a full-time PhD kind of program I'm going through, but I am working on building the website. So we will have an archive of all of our events that have been recorded 
Um, so this will be available later. Um, the last question, I guess, if every one of our guests would like to answer it, is what would what advice would you give to the next generation about Carnival? Um, Mimi, if you want to start. Who, want, who wants to go first in answering the question? Sorry, repeat the question. Sure. What advice would you give to the next generation about Carnival? Cherish your history. Cherish the tactile experience of doing it rather than watching films about it because it's in the doing we are a tactile um, race and the feeling of manufacturing making something the feeling of writing lyrics the feeling of movement and dance and when you're dressed in costume representing and becoming the thing which you're representing, even if it's just for a few hours, is an experience that cannot be felt at second hand. You have to be it and do it and experience the joy of having done it. So cherish that wonderful past and keep reinventing it. That's my take on it. Um, I would like to say that for the next generation, that your talent um, is, is the key to your career. And that if you don't know what it is, can't, through Carnival going along, you, will, you could discover what it is because it involves so many different forms of arts from music, dance, um, design and, and creativity and making. In a, in a non pressured kind of way. And so, uh, so that, that would be my thing to the next generation. Find your local carnival organization, go down there and join in and find your feet where, where you fit because you may learn from it and it will be the springboard for your career, taking you to another level into a, different, into a completely different life. It's an amazing, amazing opportunity for young people. And uh, Mimi, would you like to give your opinion? Yes, I mean, I'm in a crisis. I'm just 25 and I don't know if I'm able to talk to the next generation, <laughs> but um, I will add to what Clary and Alexander just said that um, we need to embrace our greatness, embrace our traditions and challenge them in order to make a better society and a better cultural experience. Ah, that was thank amazing. You. Thank you so much for that, Mimi. Can we please, please, please give these amazing, exceptionally talented panelists a massive, massive clap, please, and thank them for their time this afternoon because the knowledge has been just amazing. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate Alex the Great, who told us in his song, Car Carnival History Must Not Be a Mystery. And then went on to explain the history of carnival, particularly the history of carnival in Trinidad. We really appreciate that. Clary then went on to talk about the importance of telling stories with costumes and showed us the beautiful, beautiful images and explained also the stories behind them and showed carnival as art as well. We really, as to just kind of echo the sentiments of some people in the chat box, we should have a carnival museum and Clary's images should be in that carnival museum. And then finally, we had Mimi who spoke to us about Ponce Carnival and Louisa Carnival. And we are extremely, extremely grateful for that. So thank you so much for that. Um, I wanna thank all of you for coming and, and agreeing to speak with us, for us. That was 
this is I was very excited for this um, event. So thank you once again, um, and also to everyone on Caribbean Links for working really hard and getting everything put together. Um, and also everyone for tuning in and supporting us and hanging out with all of us on a Saturday. Um, yeah, just really grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And before we go, just to let you know that the next virtual panel event will be about the history. Oh, wait, no, it will not be the history of carnivals in the Caribbean. It will be in March, our next event, uh, our next virtual panel event, and it will be about Caribbean religions and cultural practices and we are really looking forward to that so we hope that you can join us for that next month in March thank you again so much for your time thank you to the Caribbean Links team you're all amazing thank you to audience and we'll see you soon bye everyone have a lovely evening bye <laughs>